You have heard and experienced the many adventures and journeys of the Elder Scrolls, but in those ventures are even more epic stories of high fantasy. Feel free to sit by the fire and allow me to spin you a yarn. Episode 1. Scrolls from the Crypt Beware the Glenumbra Banks by Garrick the Pilot What's that? You want to know about the Glenumbra Banks? I thought everyone knew about those shifting sandbars off the northwest coast of High Rock. The narrow islets that make seafaring there so dangerous close to shore. I myself have made a living for almost 30 years as a Daggerfall pilot, guiding merchant ships through the banks in and out of the city's north docks. And I'm well paid for the job, and the merchants don't complain. They see the rotting spars and twisted planks of the shipwrecks we pass as we wend our way through the channels. Those channels are treacherous and ever-changing. When we go out in early sun's dawn to meet with the first ship coming into port after the winter storms, there are always numerous visible changes to the waterways, as well as invisible changes to their depths, which we must take care to map out by frequent use of the plumb line. But the fact is, we must be ever on the lookout for changes in the banks, even in mid-year and sun's height. Now how is it that the sands shift the way they do, sometimes changing overnight even when there has been no storm? The Hearn Current runs far offshore, and in summer the breeze the mariners call the Yokodan Zephyr blows steadily but gently from the west. And yet the sands shift, and the banks change. Well, stranger, I'll tell you a secret. So long as you're buying the drinks tonight in the Rosy Lion, it's Ithgurior. Yes, you heard me right. The immortal leviathan of the Eltheric Ocean is no mere fable. Ithgurior lives and haunts the far depths of the sea, and sometimes the near shallows of the shore. He fills old channels in the banks and dredges new ones. And when a ship runs aground on the sands, he rises from the waters and dines on its sailors one by one. I suppose you're entitled to look skeptical about that. So long as you buy another round, that is. But listen, I'm not just spinning an old salt yarn. I've seen the damn thing. On nights when the moons are full and the sea is calm, you can sometimes glimpse the leviathan's oily back heaving above the surface as the old monstrosity digs his devious traps. Occasionally there's a geyser of sea mist, like when a whale blows. But then the breeze wafts ashore a demonic stench that smells like it's blown from oblivion. So there, now you know. But let's just keep this between you, me, and the tavern keeper's cat, shall we? The South Harbor is too shallow for the big merchant men, and Daggerfall depends on her sea trade continuing to find its way into the North Docks. As do I. And sailors are such a superstitious lot. No point in scaring them away, eh? Pirate King of the Abyssian by Captain Velek Sane Poke out your eyes, lad, pour lead in your ears. Those sails pretend madness, dark horror, and fear. Abandon your lasses, your ship and your gold. Blood on the water, Velek, this way comes. A noose from the rigging, a plank from boards. Do yourself in, don't try at crossing swords. Mercy's not a shipmate among that heartless horde. Blood on the water, the pirate king comes. Stout empire galleon or swift elven skiff, they every one splinter and just as soon sink. But only after crew and captain have their fun, blood on the water, your days are done. He'll tear your guts out and eat your heart raw, his eyes gleam red, his heart never thaw. Mark well these words, you quaking babes, for blood on the water follows Captain Velek Sane. Last of the Old Bones Author Unknown Many years before your time, and many well before mine, great creatures walked the surface of Nern. Where they came from, none could say. After a time, they faded and vanished. 
all gone away to the lost corners of the world. All save one. A great beast made entirely of bones did burrow a writhing path through the ground, named the Destroyer by those who survived its passage. Though none could say where it went or what drove it, all knew the barren swaths of land in its wake. It is said the Destroyer's coming could be felt as a quailing of the sod a full day before its arrival. When it arrived in a place, the great beast would writhe out shattering walls and toppling buildings. Cliffs would turn to slurry and the great wakes burnt by its pursuit, and many a pod home burst beneath its bones. It did so until it found men or myrrh who could answer its question. For the destroyer would always question its victims. The oldest accounts of these questions were all variations on where can I find the old bones? The canniest of those asked would point in a direction deemed most expediently away from and least destructive to their remaining homes. As the destroyer searched, evidently in vain, its questions changed. As it neared the end of its rampage, it was known to ask, May I sleep here? It has been so long since I slept. The only one known to answer yes to this question was the tree thane of Falinceti, the walking city. Knowing Falinceti would soon move on from where it wintered in South Point, she convinced the destroyer to sleep in the bows of Arborfell, an orchard known for its abundance of bats. There, the Yafir priesthood planted a blessed seed in the skull of the great beast as it slept. This seed soon grew into a sapling, the sapling into a great tree, and the great tree into Borobo. The bones have not stirred since. In the ages following the Destroyer's final rest, ancient bones have sometimes been unearthed throughout Valenwood. Though silent, these remains are brought to Arborfell, now the Bone Orchard, in hopes that they will always remain so. This tradition has spread throughout Valenwood. Bosmer far and wide have taken to burying the bones of their loved ones in the shade of the Burrowbo. Here they believe Yafir will grant his blessing, a final sleep for the lost. Yongle and the Sea Ghosts Author Unknown Masser and Secunda passed over Ysgrimor's people as their fellowship landed in longboats upon the rocky shores of Sarik Head, on their journey from Atmora to Mereth. Boats littered the coast, but Ysgrimor did not count his kin Yungles among them. Ysgrimor commanded the sea ghosts to surrender his kin, and a great gale darkened the sky. The seas thrashed and churned, and a wrathful storm appeared. Ysgrimor took up the oars and rowed into the storm alone. Upon the sea, Ysgrimor wrestled the sea ghosts, and the storm carried him along the jagged coast. Two fortnights passed without relief, until finally the storm broke. Come the next dawn, Yungle's longboat was found on the icy surf, but the vengeful sea ghosts have already taken Yungle and his clansmen. In his terrible grief, Ysgrimor slew a dozen dozen beasts and burned them in honor of his fallen kinsmen. A barrow hill was dug in the Atmoran tradition, and Yongle was laid to rest with rites and honors among his clansmen, far below the rocky face of Sarik Head, the first children of the sky to perish in Tamriel. The Legend of Fallen Grotto Author Unknown. Long ago, a man with seven sons and seven daughters lived in Bangkorai. Their home was in a deep and twisted cave at the edge of the woods. The surrounding forests was filled with all manner of creatures. Bears, wolves, badgers, and deer. Though his family was large, they never knew hunger, for the animals were plentiful and easy prey. We must give thanks for Hercene's blessing, he said. And the man prayed to Hercene, building within his home a shrine to the god of the hunt. He painted the walls of the cave with pigments he made by combining animal fat with the earth. From the deer his children slew, the man took antlers to make an altar. 
and his wife braided hides into leather rugs to cover the dirt floor. When the shrine was complete, the man and his family lit tallow candles and roasted an ox, pouring its blood onto the altar as they chanted prayers. <laughs> Suddenly, they heard a laugh, and before them stood Hercene himself, drawn by the death cry of the ox and the scent of its roasting flesh. You have done well, Hercene cried. Striding forward, he was clad in layers of animal hide, though his feet were bare. To prove your faith, said Hercene, send forth your seven sons and seven daughters. I will hunt them from dawn until dusk, and from dusk until dawn, until I am sated. The man recoiled in horror. I, I cannot do that, he said. You may take anything, but do not take my children from me. Eyes narrowing. Hercene raised one hand towards the cave's ceiling, then he pointed to the ground with the other. Hercene screamed, and the walls collapsed inward, destroying the shrine and the man's home. As dust curled upward like the smoke from an offering, sixteen trolls lumbered uncertainly from the debris, staggering from the grotto to the woods. You are not worthy of becoming beasts, Hercene remarked coolly, but I shall hunt you anyway. Thank you all so much for listening to the very first and Halloween-themed episode of the Elder Scrolls Book Club. If you enjoyed it, leave it a like and subscribe to keep in touch with tales like these. And if you want to know when I make a new video, hit the bell in the corner for notifications. I've been your storyteller, Big Blue VA, and I'll see you guys next time. Divines bless you.